Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about the first ever direct observation of two different exoplanets around a very similar star to our Sun. And this is actually a pretty exciting achievement because even like 10 years ago or so, we were unable to see planets directly. So let's talk a little bit more about this and why it's important and welcome to What The Man. Back a few decades ago, if you were to ask us how we're going to be looking for planets in the future, I think most of us would say, well, I guess we're just going to have a very powerful telescope, we're going to look directly at distant stars and try to distinguish planets around them. But today we know that this is a little bit impractical and is extremely difficult to achieve. Mostly because the stars are usually really, really bright, so they sort of extinguish pretty much most of the other bright objects next to them. Seeing planets this way is very difficult. But the major five methods of finding planets are essentially right here on the screen. The one that we've been most productive with and the one that we use the most is the so-called transit method, where all we're doing is looking at the star's brightness and then looking at very periodic dips in its brightness. This is essentially the shadow of the planet passing in front of the star. Back when the original Kepler mission was launched, nobody expected that we're going to find so many different planets so quickly. And prior to Kepler mission, there were actually several other missions proposed by the scientists, which were unfortunately cancelled. One such mission was going to use direct imaging of various stars, and then essentially cover the star with a so-called coronagraph, which is responsible for covering the star's brightness and allowing us to see what's around it in its vicinity. And even though this technique is not very complex, it does require extreme precision and includes a few more challenges in order for us to see these planets directly. So as of today, only some planets were discovered in this way, and the first such planet was discovered back in 2004 by the VLT, also known as the Very Large Telescope of the European Southern Observatory. But their technique has been improving over the years, and now they've discovered something else really, really cool, with the actual image being right here. But before I explain what we're looking at, let's actually go back uh, to the original mission that was proposed prior to the Kepler mission. So NASA actually did have a plan for so-called visible light coronographer that was supposed to be an actual telescope in space. This mission was called Terrestrial Planet Finder and it's just one of the many missions that NASA cancelled over the years. So here, this mission was officially cancelled in 2011 but would have been a pretty complex system of telescopes looking at approximately 100 or so nearby stars and trying to discover all of their planets and of course possible planets similar to Earth. This is of course before the Kepler mission, so back then a lot of scientists believed that this was our best chance to find these exoplanets. And when you look at the details of the mission, the complexity was actually quite mind-blowing. Here the possibility of finding a planet next to a typical nearby star would be equivalent to trying to find a tiny firefly next to an extremely bright searchlight at a distance of several kilometers. So this is a pretty difficult mission, but NASA had all of the plans for this mission to be successful. Unfortunately, the funding didn't come in, so the mission was cancelled. VLT, on the other hand, continued its mission and has developed techniques that allow it to see planets even better. And have been doing a pretty good job at discovering planets around these distant, but somewhat similar to Sun stars. So this is the star we're talking about today. And only a few years ago, we've actually already discovered the first planet here. The planet is really far away from the star, but it was directly observed by the scientists and we've already confirmed that this was definitely a planet orbiting this particular star. There were a few other objects discovered though, as you can see in this particular image, but the scientists weren't sure if what we're looking at are planets or distant stars behind or in front of the star system. So some additional observations were needed in order to establish if these are planets we're looking at or if they're just distant stars. In terms of the location in the night skies, this is kind of where it's located, around 300 light years away from planet Earth. It's also, as I mentioned previously, extremely similar to our Sun, but this is a very young star. It's only about 17 million years old, and that of course suggests to us that, well, maybe this is actually what our Sun used to be like as well, and maybe this star system could represent the early solar system and we should study it in a little bit more detail. And so the new analysis definitely shows us that there are two planets here. 
two very distant and also really really massive planets. The distances here are extremely large. So this here is comparable to the entire solar system, whereas the distance to the first planet is about 160 astronomical units away from the center. That's kind of like four times farther away than Pluto is. The second object is about twice as far away, so this is about 320 astronomical units. Both of these objects would technically be in the so-called Oort's cloud. They would be cometary objects, and because these are really massive planets, it's kind of interesting for us to figure out how they got there, and most importantly, if the solar system also had these objects in the beginning of its birth. With this region right here, of course, being the so-called planetary disk where all of the other planets will be forming with time. And also, these planets are pretty massive. The outer planet is about 6 times the mass of Jupiter, and the inner planet is about 14 times the mass of Jupiter, which also suggests that this is probably a brown dwarf, a type of an object that's not really a star and that's not really a planet. These are really massive but also really mysterious objects, and we of course want to know why our solar system doesn't really have any. And if it had any, where did they actually go? But because the orbits of these planets take so long, as a matter of fact the inner planet takes over 2000 years to orbit around the star once, it took a lot of observations and follow-up observations to establish that these are indeed planets and not just stars. In other words, the scientists did actually see slight motion across the star system in order to confirm that these two are definitely planets. And by the way, in this simulation, this is like several hundred years per second. So these are really, really slow moving objects. But the most impressive part of the mission is how the scientists were able to adapt to various challenges that we've had a few years ago. So this is what's known as adaptive optics, and this is exactly what the scientists used to discover this planet. And this is the instrument known as Sphere that's part of the VLT network. Here, by first adapting to the star flicker, and then by choosing just the right coronographer for each individual star, the scientists are then able to see the planets nearby with a lot of accuracy. And this is exactly how they were able to find this planet, which also means that with time this technique is only going to get more advanced and much better at finding planets, and so we might not even need to launch any telescopes, and will instead rely on extremely powerful computers to do most of the work for us. And this once again shows you how all of these tiny ingenuities are eventually leading us closer and closer to discovering more answers about the universe, and eventually all of these discoveries and all of these really cool techniques will start to become part of our daily life here on Earth. Obviously we don't really know how this is going to be used just yet, but it will be used eventually. But in terms of this particular discovery and this planetary system, well, it does raise a lot of questions about the history of the Sun and the history of the solar system. We need to find more similar stars and more similar objects first, before we can actually start asking questions if these brown dwarfs and these massive planets existed around the Sun as well. And if so, once again, where did they go? Did something else capture them? Or did they escape for some other reason? But I guess until we discover more about these planets, or until we find more unusual, interesting and exciting planetary systems out there, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Consider supporting this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot, and alternatively you can also support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.